Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Hades. Hades is the king of the underworld and the god of the dead, and I'm not sure if it gets any darker than that. It was believed that just by speaking his name, he would have the power to bring you to the underworld, so people tried to avoid his name like it was Voldemort. Hades was sure to never let any souls that entered the underworld escape, and he would punish anyone who tried, or anyone who tried to save someone in the underworld. One of his darkest myths is in reference to the time he kidnapped Persephone. Persephone. He opened up the earth where she was picking flowers and he kept her in the underworld. Persephone's mother, Demeter, was of course really unhappy about this and did everything she could to get her back. Hades finally agrees to let her go, but of course there's always a twist with these guys. He gives her a little pomegranate seed as a parting gift, which she eats. Little does she know, if you eat food from the underworld, it binds you to it. So now she is bound to Hades, and basically the story ends off with her being allowed to live a few months of the year on Earth, but the rest of the time she is stuck in the underworld. So yeah, Hades is just out there kidnapping people, which is just really super uncool. In our number 9 spot today we have Loki. Loki is a Nordic god and he is quite the little trickster as he basically deceived his way into becoming a deity. Basically there is a place called Asgard and when that was being built by Odin, who is the king of gods, Loki came and offered to help out with the build. To make a long story short, basically there was a giant helping with the build and Loki made a special deal with him. If the giant finished the build by a certain time, he would be owed the sun, the moon, and the goddess Freya. Odin obviously didn't want to give these things over, but Loki assured him that the giant wouldn't be able to complete the build by that day. What Loki didn't know is that the giant had a stallion who was helping him, and he was on track to finish the build and win this deal. That's when Loki decided to transform himself into a mare. In mare form, he went over and wooed this stallion and led him off into the woods. In the woods, one thing led to another. You know, and Loki, in mere form, ended up pregnant. After this, he gave birth to an eight legged spider horse for some reason that I do not know, and then he gave this weird baby spider horse to Odin as a gift, and apparently that is how he became a god. But also, this led to the giant being killed by Thor, so the story is both weird and very messed up. In our number eight spot today, we have Huitzilopochtli. Huitzilopochtli is a god in the Aztec religion, and he is the god of the sun, but also of war and human sacrifice. His origin story is a pretty wild one. So his mother is Coatlicue and she is very important. She already had other fully grown children when she was impregnated with him. Her grown children were the female deity Coalshaki and her 400 brothers. All of these children were really mad at how she became pregnant again and they began conspiring to kill her, which is absolutely nuts. This is when Huitzilopochtli burst from his mother's womb in full armor and he was also fully grown. He knew about the conspiring and he fought his brothers and sisters literally right after being born. He then beheaded his sister and threw her body off the mountaintop, which is honestly I don't know, kind of crazy, kind of dark. After this, he chased his brothers around and they became scattered all throughout the sky. This is why he is seen as the sun, his sister the moon, and his brothers are the stars. In our number seven spot today, we have Amit. Amit is an ancient Egyptian goddess with the head of a crocodile, the body of a lion or leopard, and the bottom of a hippopotamus. The name Amit means eater of the damned or devourer of the dead, and that is honestly pretty much exactly what she is. She is greatly feared and for good reason. She lives near the scales of justice in Duat, which is the Egyptian underworld. This is where she does her work. After a person dies, their heart is weighed on the scales against the feather of truth. If the heart was light enough, the person would be allowed to pass to the afterlife, but Ahmed is always waiting for those whose hearts are heavy. If a person's heart was too heavy and unbalanced the scale, then Ahmed would eat the heart and they would be denied entry to the afterlife. It is said that the souls of those who were denied were destined to be restless forever. In our number six spot today, we have Apollo. Apollo is the Greek god who is the son of Zeus, and at a first glance, he seems like a pretty likable guy, but he's done some extremely questionable things. You know what they say, like father, like son, and in the case of Apollo, that is pretty accurate considering he has quite a temper. Apollo has been known to punish people with illness and plague, which is very dark. During the Trojan War, Apollo shot arrows that had been infected with the plague 
plague into a Greek camp. There's also another story about him where he was rejected by Cassandra, who was the daughter of King Priam and Queen Hecuba of Troy, so he decided to punish her. He gave her the ability to see the future, but only the tragedies that the future holds. And the worst part, if she told anyone, no one would believe her. In our number 5 spot today, we have Berstuk. Berstuk is a Wendish evil god of the forest, and he is known for his trickery. He is often described as being half man and half goat, but there are some sources which claim he is actually a shadow and doesn't have a human form at all, and instead is more of a spirit of the woods. So here's what dark thing he's got going on. He likes to trick wanderers of the forest into getting lost. Yep, it's just literally a full on nightmare. He hangs out in the dark depths of the forest, waiting for the moment to strike. Once a wanderer stumbles across his path, he'll play tricks where he changes the path in the woods, or he'll whisper in their ears to frighten them like it's the Chamber of Secrets, or he'll lay branches in their way so they'll trip and fall. And he does this all simply because he enjoys the suffering of others. Many of the other gods on this list also do some good things, but I couldn't find any happy or nice stories about this one. In our number 4 spot today we have Izanami and Izanagi. This is kind of like a 2 for 1 deal because both of these people play a very big role in this story. Izanami no Mikoto comes to us from Japanese mythology, and her name means she who invites. She is the goddess of both creation and death, and she is the former wife of the god Izanagi no Mikoto. So it's a bit of a long story, but basically at one point she dies. That's really all you need to know about that. This of course upsets her husband, so he goes to the land of the dead to find her. Once he does, he can't quite see her because I guess the visibility isn't great in the underworld. He then goes to take her home with him, but she says she can't leave because she has already eaten the food of the underworld, which has made her one with the dead. It's a common theme, I guess, in different religions. Later, when she's sleeping, he takes a torch up to her face and sees that she is no longer beautiful, but has rotting flesh with maggots, like as if she's like a zombie. At this point he runs the heck away because she woke up and is now trying to chase him down with her gross zombie face. He ends up making it all the way to the entrance to the world of the dead and he pushes a huge boulder in front of it that now separates the world of the dead from the world of the living, but it also sadly separates him from his wife. Of course she is mad at everything that just happened, even though she was acting pretty weird and is also dead. So she swears that she will kill 1000 living people every day because he left her there, and to this he replies that he will offer 1500. I mean, can we blame him? In our number 3 spot today we have Firo. Firo comes from Maori mythology and he is the lord of darkness and the embodiment of evil. He of course needs a home to match his dark persona, so he resides in the underworld. He is responsible for all illness of people and some tribes believe that when people die, they descend into the underworld where Firo eats them and for each body he consumes, he gains more strength and eventually he may grow powerful enough to break free from the underworld. If he is a able to do this, then he will be able to come to the surface and devour everyone and everything. This is why the people who followed this mythology believe so strongly in cremation, because he cannot gain strength from ashes. Firo lives in what is called the house of death, and it is a dark, creepy cave that preserves all things evil like black magic and the personifications of illness and disease. I don't know about you guys, but personally, I hope Firo stays in his little cave safe and sound in the underworld because I don't want any part in whatever he's got going on. In our number 2 spot today we have Guayota. Guayota is a deity that comes from the Guanche mythology of Tenerife. He is actually the primary dark god in this mythology and plays a very integral role in the story. He is represented as a black dog and also always had other black dogs around him that were actually demons. According to the legend, he lived inside the Teta volcano as it was a gateway to the underworld. At some point, he actually kidnapped Magek, who is the god of the sun, and shut them up in a volcano so as to throw the world into darkness. After humans prayed to their supreme god Akamen, he went and saved Magek and locked Guayota up inside the volcano instead. I think it's safe to say that a god who steals the sun and locks it away definitely needs to be hidden inside of a volcano. For sure the best place for them. In our number one spot today we have Lamashtu. Lamashtu is a demon, monster, malevolent goddess or demigoddess who comes from Mesopotamian mythology and she certainly certainly is terrible. Her name means she who erases, and this is because she would prey on women during childbirth and wait for them to be breastfeeding their new baby so that she could kidnap it and eat its flesh. I honestly don't know if it gets any darker than that. She was also known to disturb sleep and cause nightmares as one of her 
less worse qualities, but she would also be known to harm the environment, bound the muscles of men, and would bring sickness and disease. Mothers who were expecting children would wear an amulet that depicted her in order to protect their pregnancy from her. Some people would even leave offerings to keep her appeased, which would always be small feminine objects. Some women would even go as far as to summon Pazuzu, son of Hanbi, the demon god, in order to protect them from Lamashtu's evil, as Pazuzu was her one weakness. Pazuzu protected them either because he felt bad for the expectant mothers, or because he simply just hated Lamashtu. Either way, at least he was there to help instead of harm. There were some cultures where Lamashtu was regarded as a guardian, but that definitely was not the case for all. Number 10, the dedication of Eklavia. You know what you shouldn't do as a teacher? Make a student who is really talented self-sabotage themselves so they don't beat out another kid, which is exactly what happened to Eklavia. Eklavia was a very talented young boy who lived deep in the forest among his tribe. He wanted to become the best archer in the world and he was very well on his way to becoming it. However, when he asked to become a student of the great Drona, he was denied due to his poor social standing. But Eklavia was not deterred. He built a statue of his idol instead and let it inspire him as he practiced archery every day. He became so skilled that when Drona learned of this, he was afraid he would surpass his best student, Arjuna. So he demanded that Glavia payment for studying under him, even though it wasn't technically under him, in the form of his right thumb. Then, sadly, the story doesn't really have a happy ending. The boy cut off his thumb right there and then, forfeiting his dreams of becoming the best in the biz. So overall, Work hard to get where you want to, and then give over to jealousy and have let someone cut your thumb off so that you'll never achieve it. Number nine, Manushwa. Confusing and terrifying? We love a little bit of everything here on Bumblebee, which is why I bring you Manushwa, a terrifying creature slash demon that delights in scratching the faces off its victims, a very specific thing, leaving them for dead. No one quite knows what it looks like, but the most common description is a hairy spider with soulless eyes. Spiders already have soulless eyes, I hate them. They are known for attacking only at night and sometimes cause strange blackouts before they attack. Now, many believed for a long time that it was simply the stuff of legend, a scary bedtime story told to make sure children behave. But in the early 2000s, the town of Kampur, India blamed several attacks on the creature. Several people reported attacks at night and awoke with strange abrasions on their faces. Even more mysteriously, the victims entirely blacked out on the events leading up to it. Police as well as civilians became so convinced that it was real and it was attacking their community that they led special searches at night. But then, almost as soon as they had begun, the attacks stopped, leaving behind yet another legend of a bedtime story becoming real. Number 8, The Devotion of Sordas. Genuine question for all of you. If you saw the most beautiful thing, place, person in the world and knew that nothing else would ever be as perfect, would you wish to keep your sight or have your sight taken away because nothing would ever come close to it. Personally, I'd probably keep my sight because you never know. But Sardas was so devoted to Lord Krishna that he had his sight taken away again. He loved Krishna so much that he wrote song after song in his praise. Sardas was a blind man but had a heart for music. One day Sardas fell into a well and Krishna saved him. Radha, his companion, became jealous and against Krishna's orders saying to stay away from him, she went to him anyways. As she passed, Sardas clutched onto her anklets. When he wouldn't let go, she revealed herself but Sardas couldn't confirm her identity so he held on. Krishna then graced him with vision and let go of the anklets. He was so stunned at having finally seen his hero that he asked to be blind again as nothing would ever come close to it. My question is, if he was blind since birth, how would he even know what Radha looked like to identify her? Would he just have been overwhelmed by her amazing goddessness? I don't know. Number seven, Nishi Doc. Have you ever turned around at your desk thinking someone just called your name? Or could you have sworn you heard someone say your name walking home alone at night in the dark? This has definitely happened to me and it certainly makes me wonder whether there is a supernatural reason. Otherwise, why does almost every culture have a myth related to voices in the dark? The Nishidok from Hindu mythology is a dark entity that lures travelers deep into the forest areas by making it sound like a loved one is calling to them. This is the moment where curiosity could kill the cat because if it got the better of you, you could end up dead. The voices will lead you to a deserted area away from prying eyes and then snap, it will devour you. But what if it's actually someone I know who needs help? 
Well, there is one way to tell. Wait for them to call a third time. The Nishida can only say your name twice, so if it no longer says it again, keep moving as it is surely the Nishida. Number six, Nail Ba. Part of the role that mythology plays is to establish rules and boundaries for society, especially children. If you don't want a young one playing by the river alone, you tell them a scary story about a monster who lives there so they won't go near it. But did they really have to go this hard with this one? Damn! Nail Ba is a terrifying dark demonic spirit that walks the streets visiting people's houses. Her name has been written on the doors and walls of small towns and villages in rural Bangalore to deter the spirit from entering. Some variations of the myth say that she is the spirit of a wandering bride seeking her husband. If you open the door to receive her, she will take the man of the house and bring bad luck to the household. Another version says, which is kind of where it gets confusing, says that should you open the door in the first place, you will be cursed to die within 24 hours. Apparently she speaks in the voices of your friends and family in order to appear more trustworthy. Villagers write her name on the door to ward her off, as they should. Number 5 Boba I love all the legends that circulate sleep paralysis. If you have ever experienced it, you know how terrifying it can be. We know that it is a global phenomenon as most cultures around the world have lore surrounding it. The one that belongs to Indian mythology is the boba. When people experience sleep paralysis, symptoms often include seeing shadowy figures, you're unable to move, there is pressure on your chest, pretty much having a nightmare while you're awake. The boba is said to be a horrific creature who causes it. Made of shadows, the boba's entity preys on those who sleep on their back. Very specific. So no side sleepers here. It strangles its victims to death while asleep and it is said to be a paranormal explanation for sleep paralysis. So side sleepers, like me, you're safe. If you sleep on your back, you're in trouble. Number four, Hiran Yakshipo. Is it better to be feared or respected? Respected, obviously, that's what I think. Because hopefully, no one will be looking to stab you in the back if they're so afraid of you, you know what I mean? So it was only a matter of time for the self proclaimed king of demons, his words, not anyone else's. Even his own son was like, nah, dad. Even though he wasn't the one who did it, he wanted everyone to believe that he created the universe and that he was uncontrollable. His son was, of course, one of the ones who refused to take his belief. Not a good luck for him, so he of course tried to kill his own son. No love when you're the king of demons apparently, but every time he tried to even harm his son, he walked out of it unscathed. The reason, Vishnu was protecting him the entire time. But how would they get rid of his father? Well, because he could not be killed by a human, devil, or animal, Vishnu created a blend of creatures creating something entirely different. It was called Narasimha, and one day at twilight, he laid on the king of demons lap and disemboweled him with his claws. I feel like the King of Demons was like, oh look a kitty thing, oh no no, ah, and then died. Number 3, Raktabija. This dude seriously sounds terrifying and I don't know how anybody beat him, but it, they had to create a whole god to get rid of him. Raktabija wasn't just one demon in Indian mythology, he could simultaneously be hundreds, thousands, millions. If one drop of his blood hit the ground, another Raktabija would form. And worse than that, the creature would actually get more powerful when a new version of himself was formed. It was like a huge narcissistic thing. I'm not sure how that works, especially since he's only a tiny baby part. Like, whoa, I'm so powerful. As you can imagine, he was incredibly difficult to defeat. Every time he spilled blood, it was like, whoa, there's more of you. So the gods combined all of their power and created Kali, the destroyer of demons, a grotesque looking goddess decorated with bloody limbs. You know the one, the lady with the multiple arms dancing about. Yeah, an equally fierce demon to face, Raktabija. During their battle, of course, his blood poured onto the ground from his wounds, creating thousands of demons. But instead of letting the blood drop to the floor, Kali pierced him and drank all of the blood so not a single drop would hit the floor. And that was how she destroyed him. Kind of like the OG battle vampire. Number two, Putana. It takes some guts to take on the dude who was literally born to destroy you, but Putana thought she could do it. Putana was an evil demon who was passionate about taking the lives of the young. Needless to say, not someone you want out of daycare. When baby Krishna was born, it was foretold that he would destroy all the demons. Literally his job. So Putana thought she could take the guy out early. She disguised herself as a beautiful young woman, laced her breast with poison and entered his room. Because of her disguise, nobody thought twice and so she sat down to feed the babe. But unfortunately for her, she made a huge mistake. Krishna was born to destroy demons. 
never mind the poison. And as he fed from her, he sucked her life away instead. Putana died in absolute agony and Krishna assured everyone that he was here to do one thing and one thing only, his job. And last but not least, number one, Mahisha Sura. Look, I can understand appreciating the beauty of an animal, but when bestiality is thrown into the mix, uh, we gotta pull the reins on that. I know Zeus from Greek mythology was all about that as well. It just seems to be a thing that gods like to do across the world. It's a global thing. Remember the King of Demons? Well, this was another demon king who was the son of the King of Demons, but not the one previously mentioned. But anyways, his mother was a buffalo. His father had fallen in love with the beauty of a buffalo and married her. Mahisha means buffalo and Asura means demon in Hindi, therefore buffalo demon. No man on this planet could kill him and he was a very confident dude. He started a war with the people and won. His power knew no bounds because of course what man could kill him? However, there was a catch. A man couldn't kill him, but a woman could. But what woman could kill someone so strong? So the gods created the goddess Durga, and she waged war on the tyrant, finally fulfilling the prophecy. Boy oh boy, do I love a loophole. Number 10, Hathor. The goddess Hathor was originally created by her dad, Ra, as a destroyer of men. She was supposed to punish all those who were disobedient to him. But then, Ra was like, meh. I don't really like that idea, he just kind of changed his mind and decided to make her the exact opposite, instead the goddess of love. But she kind of loved killing men and like even he couldn't stop her. So one night he gave her what was supposed to be a mug of ale, but actually made it like a special kind of blood and she got so drunk off of it that she got too tired out to kill anymore and therefore became the goddess of love. <laughs> Drunk in love, am I right? Her cult was centered in Dendera, where she was also seen as the goddess of fertility and childbirth. When the Greeks occupied Egypt, they compared her with the goddess Aphrodite. But unlike the voluptuous woman Aphrodite was depicted as, Hathor came in three forms, and I bet you can't guess which. She was depicted as either a woman with a cow's ears, wearing the headdress of a cow, or just a cow. Moo. <laughs> Number nine, the beginning of the world. I yeah, what a what an inventive way to imagine the beginning of things. I mean, the Big Bang is still pretty crazy too. But hey, here we go. Freaking love how much magic is in these stories. Like I'm in because that's all there was at the beginning of the universe, according to the ancient Egyptians. Just swirling darkness, chaos, and magic. Heka, the god of magic, was the only thing that existed, waiting for the opportune moment to begin. Then a hill showed up called Ben Ben, and out of which the god Atum erupted from. He was lonely, so he mated with his own shadow to give birth to two children, Shu and Tefnut. Shu gave life, Tefnut gave order. They left their their father to build the world, but they were gone so long he took out his eye and sent it to search for them. In the meantime, he just kind of sat there contemplating eternity all alone. It was really sad. This guy sounds like Zeus mixed with Eeyore. Anyways, his kids came back and he was so happy he wept tears of joy and out of which were born men and women. They also brought his eye back, so that was nice. Number eight, light as a feather. So unlike a lot of religions we've heard of, there wasn't really a concept of hell in Egyptian mythology. It was either you were worthy of heading into the afterlife or you weren't. Mat was the goddess of harmony and supported the belief that if harmony was disrupted, it must be restored. Every ancient Egyptian myth in some form follows this format. But the most important role she played was in the afterlife. When the soul left the body, it would appear in the hall of truth in order to stand judgment before Osiris. The heart would be weighed on a golden scale against Mat white feather. If the heart was heavier, it would be devoured by a monster and the soul would disappear. If it was lighter, then you could go live in eternal bliss. So instead of several layers of burning torment, souls in Egypt instead faced eternal darkness and unconsciousness. The idea of non-existence was more terrifying than being cut up by demons. Huh. Number seven, Osiris and Isis. Okay, so we aren't strangers to deities being a fan of incest. It was kind of like how they multiplied and ancient Greeks were okay with it kind of, but they kind of weren't. Anyways, the Egyptian gods were no exception. Isis and Osiris were two of the four children of the goddess of Nut. Isis and Osiris were married and actually, really in love. They, they, they dug each other. When Osiris rose to the throne as the eldest sibling, his brother Set was, pretty jealous. So he took the life of his own brother, cut him into little pieces and scattered them all over Egypt. 
He really wanted to make sure the guy was dead. But then Isis wasn't someone you wanted to mess with. She had great magical powers capable of restoring life. She collected all of the pieces of her brother slash husband and breathed life back into him. Osiris returned to life and they made all the love and then soon conceived a child named Horus. However, Osiris couldn't return to the land of the living, so he had to stay and rule over the underworld. So his son Horus was left to get revenge, and we'll get to that later. Number six, Anubis. Now, I think in Western films that depict ancient Egypt, like The Mummy Returns, the god Anubis is often associated with the underworld. You know, that creepy half man, half jackal creature who appears to walk out of your nightmares? He's so creepy. Well, he did used to run the underworld until Osiris took over, but he was actually the god of mummification and the afterlife. So, not wrong, but not the whole story. Anubis was the son of Nephthys and Set. Well, kind of. Nephthys actually never conceived the child with Set. She kind of had a she kind of had the hots for Osiris. So, she disguised herself as Isis and made love to him that way and then Anubis came to life. That may have been one of the reasons Seth attacked Osiris in the first place as his suspicions rose. But it was actually Anubis who helped Isis piece together Osiris, creating the first mummy. Fun fact, during the Greek rule of Egypt, Anubis and Hermes were seen kind of as the same. The people who ferried the dead to the underworld. Oh, sorry, and a point. Anubis was actually the one who weighed people's hearts, so he used the feather. The thing, you know what to do. He was responsible for doing that. Number five, Horus and Set. Speaking of Horus, earlier. Remember how I said Horus had to take over defending his father? Well, here is where this story begins. When Horus grew up to be a man, he pulled a Hamlet. He was like, you killed my father, prepare to die. Thus, a series of battles ensued, and one of the gods didn't play fair. Set kept cheating at everything and continued to come out as victor. Not surprising since he didn't earn his way on the throne, he killed for it, kind of like a certain Claudius. Eventually, Isis stepped up to help her son slash nephew overcome her brother. She set a trap for Set, but after some pitiless begging for his own life, she let him go. Horus was pissed, so angry some of the other gods got upset that he was so angry. They agreed to compete in a final boat race and Horus was like crushing it. He was doing really well, he was about to win. But then of course, Set cheated by turning into a hippopotamus and attacked the boat. Therefore claiming victory once again. Osiris finally showed up and declared that no man should take the throne through murder. So Horus took the throne. Why Osiris didn't just settle the whole deal from the beginning is confusing in itself, but hey, kind of reminded me of the eagles that showed at the end of Lord of the Rings that could have saved like three movies, you know? Kind of like that. Anyways, let's move on. Number four, Ra and his boat. Ra is one of the most revered gods in Egyptian mythology, especially since he was the god of the sun. He was depicted as a man with the head of a falcon. That kind of makes sense. He was once the greatest of all gods, but had to take a step back after he got too old and tired, and especially considering his task, I can see why. His job was to drive away darkness and sail across the skies, delivering light wherever he went. But at night, he would dive into the underworld and have to cross 12 gates. 12 hours, an hour per gate. After paying his respect to Osiris every night, a giant snake named Apophis tried to attack and swallow the boat. Every night! Poor guy, no wonder he got worn out. Every day it got harder to defend, and even one night, Apophis succeeded, but could only hold the sunlight for so long. She threw it up, which explained solar eclipses. After Set was cast out after the whole nephew battle, he ended up serving Ra in his boat and kept the snake at bay. But there's something confusing coming later that I think you'll agree is very confusing. So here we go. Coming up next, we have Bast, number three. Have you ever had a cat look you up and down and kind of like expect something? like worship, you know? Are you a cat person, dog person? Let me know in the comments. Well, that's because cats were a big deal in Egyptian mythology. They even had their own goddess. Bastet was a cat goddess depicted as a woman with a cat's head. Cats had a meaningful role in ancient Egypt as they protected their food from rats and snakes. They were even seen as family members and to harm one was punishable by death. Legend says that sometimes cats would enter burning buildings to save their families. If they died, the goddess would bring them back to life, hence the idea of cats having nine lives. There it is. Now, here's where things get confusing. You know that story I told about Ra? Well, apparently, Bastet was in the boat with him as well. During the day, she would ride with him, and at night, she would turn into a cat and then defend the boat from Apophis the snake. But I thought that was set. So many conflicting things. I saw like a couple different stories who said, each thing was different, so who knows. Number two, Jeb and Nut. Yet another sibling partnership, we have Jeb and Nut. 
they fell deeply in love and could never be separated. They were that couple who would like constantly be like, oh my god, stop, right next to each other at dinner, you know what I mean? Jab was the god of the earth and Nut was the god of the sky. A previously mentioned god, Atum, found their union inappropriate, so he pushed Nut into the sky far away from Jeb. He just didn't like being a third wheel. Jeb and Nut were close enough to see each other, but could never hold each other again. And she gave birth to Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Some say Horus too, but I don't think that's true. Number one, the treasure thief. Okay, I don't know how I feel about this story, okay? This doesn't really feel like harmony is in balance, but anyways. The treasure thief ends in a way I really didn't expect and I'm not sure you will either. Long ago, a great pharaoh with a wealth of riches decided to build a pyramid in which to keep them safe. One of the builders was wise to his plan and decided to find a way to claim them for himself. He built a stone vault with a hidden entrance covered by a slab so he could get to the riches. But unfortunately, he fell ill before he could return, so he told his sons of his plan. The sons headed to the pyramid in the dead of night, following the their father's order, but unbeknownst to them, the pharaoh had laid booby traps and one brother was caught in one. Not wanting to be found or interrogated, revealing his other brother, he told his brother to chop his head off. Ugh, that he did. Loyalty? I don't know. The pharaoh upon finding the body hung it up in the town square in the hopes of like weeding out whoever it belonged to. But the other brother being so clever got the guards drunk and stole back his brother's body in the dead of night. The pharaoh was like, I'm not even mad. I'm just impressed. He gave the thief a pardon, summoned him to the square and gave his daughter to marry him. Yeah, dude, you tried to steal my jewels? Don't worry about it. Have my daughter, because you're so talented at your job. Great work. 